for joining. Um, I think we'll just, we'll begin. So for those of you who do not know me, my name is Dr. Stuart Malcolm. Um, I'm a long COVID doctor here with Rhythm. Um, I technically have the position of medical director, but um, you know, a lot of you know me um, as your doctor. Um, and so I wanted to give this presentation and I'll get to why we're doing this, but um, we will begin. So let me share my screen. I'm gonna bring up the chat. All right, great. Okay, so we got Zach. John is saying, oob, what's this? <laughs> Ryan's saying, hello. Okay, hi, everyone. Okay, let's get started, okay? So I am going to uh, do, 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 do this. Okay, so perfect. Okay, sorry, I'm new to this. Welcome. All right, so let's get started. So I am titling this talk a year on, Lessons from Being a Long COVID Doctor. And so... Um, I wanted to let everyone know that that um, I've been a long COVID doctor, um, I think as long as this disease has existed. And I definitely didn't know, uh, you know, all the things I know now. Um, it's been a learning experience, but today marks 365 days of being a long COVID doctor at Rhythm. And I just think that's a really important mark. And I wanted to just be able to share some information and kind of some feelings about long COVID. So let's begin. So. Um, usually in medicine, we give case presentations, so like as a, a, um, a way to learn, but also um, just to illustrate certain things about long COVID. Um, so let's begin. So here we go. So as a med student, you give a presentation, um, you know, your, your boss would yell at you or give you an A or an F or whatever. We want to always have a learning objective. So our learning objectives today or to discuss a case of long COVID, to review history, attempted therapies, et cetera, et cetera, and how this contributes to a long COVID assessment, um, to outline the organization and testing of a long COVID patient, how we're using that at Rhythm and why that's important, um, and then outline a specific pathophysiology of COVID, of long COVID. Okay, so let's start with the case. So um, we are going to start with a guy that, like many of you, was really perfectly healthy before this. But what I like telling people is that other clinicians that live in this world say long COVID all often reveals what uh, was underlying that we didn't know about ourselves. So he has a, uh, a past medical history of mononucleosis. So that is an active Epstein-Barr virus infection of the age of nine. Now, EBV is in all of us, or most of us. 90% of us have an Epstein-Barr virus infection. And it makes me wonder, as a long COVID doc, why did this person get mononucleosis or the kissing disease when they were nine, whereas most of us actually did quite well. We know from long COVID data that uh, two thirds of long COVID folks actually have reactivation of EBV. So it's just important to note that in the history. Otherwise, super healthy guy. Surgical history, appendectomy, he had ACL uh, reconstruction. So this is a tendon. Um, it makes me wonder, hey, was that just because you were in a car accident or you like you know, twisted your ankle when you were like playing soccer or something like that? Or is there some sort of like underlying weakness to your ligaments that might've caused that issue? Um, history of trauma, so none, he didn't have any trauma. So again, that's emotional, mental well-being, but also physical trauma that's really important um, for our patients. Uh, family history, I'm not sure if you can see this, if my face is in the way, um, not sure how to move this, but he has a history of uh, gluten insensitivity um, in the family, as well as hypothyroidism um, uh, in several family members. So that asks me, hey, in a condition that there seems to be some autoimmunity, is this person predisposed? If you had asked this young man before long COVID, hey, do, do you have anything wrong with you? He'd say, yeah, maybe I had a surgery, um, but that really uh, nothing really of note would have come out. But really by picking it apart, we do notice some things um, that are important um, in our world. So let's move on. Uh, oh, actually, can't forget the social history. Uh, not a drinker, not a smoker, not a drug user. And that can be helpful just to know kind of underlying health. Uh, so moving on, so let's talk about his history of pet present illness, or what we would call the HBI. So he had, and what the HBI is, is acute COVID to present day long COVID. So he had an acute infection in, in December of 2020. He, uh, his symptoms are really important to know, and I'll talk about why, but he had shortness of breath, intense chest pressure, sore throat and dysphagia, meaning difficulty swallowing, mild fever, arm and leg tingling, 
night sweats that were really bad and drenching, but not hospitalized. So why is this important to me as a long COVID doctor? Well, one, some people come to me and they were like, my long COVID was nothing. And I, I barely even noticed it. And other people are like, hey, my long COVID was just diarrhea. And I didn't even know I had long COVID until like I went into the, the clinic. So it's just a disease that presents in many different ways. And it might indicate to us the physiology of what's going on in someone's long COVID. So for someone who has shortness of breath and chest pressure, um, that might indicate microclotting or some sort of issue uh, affecting the vasculature. In someone with you know, sore throat dysphagia, is that affecting a nerve? Is that just the location of the infection? The arm tingling and leg tingling, is that nerve damage? Is that from certain mast cells being activated? So all of this just really does contribute to how I feel about this. So let's talk about his treatments. You got ivermectin, azithromycin, prednisone, and IV fluid. So there is some data uh, regarding uh, using steroids during an initial infection that could be helpful. Um, but it's important for me to know, did you try anything? Did, did this affect kind of your course of COVID? The, that we then always talk about vaccination. So he received a COVID vaccine in April, July, and December of 2021. Very important to note when this happened and what your side effects were, if any, to vaccination. So he noted that in April and July that his vaccines caused him to be bedridden for three days, almost needing to go to the emergency department. And so that's important to know because for me, when I got my vaccine, um, I had a really bad fever. I was out for a day, but then I went to work the next day. For him, this was a really serious thing, almost feeling like he needed to go to the ER. So of note, back in April of 2021, his first vaccination, he said it felt very similar to my first infection. I had lots of headaches, fever, brain fog, and fatigue. My resting heart rate went up about 10 to 15 beats during this first few days, and his POTS symptoms worsened. So POTS is uh, kind of a difficult thing to say. A lot of my patients know what that is. Some people will just say, hey, I've got POTS. Do you actually have a diagnosis? Is it lightheadedness? Is it fast heart rate? And uh, so it's really making sure that I, I know what that means, but he, he felt like he was lightheaded and his heart rate was going quick. So let's jump into his long COVID history. So he did feel like his long COVID became apparent one month after infection. His symptoms, and we always kind of, I always ask my patients, hey, what is your worst symptom? Um, is there anything um, that is, uh, and I will often apologize saying, again, tell me again and again, what's the story? What do you feel is going on? And so for him, the worst symptoms are fatigue, brain fog, and headaches. But he also has some other symptoms. One is my neck feels cold. And again, I've heard everything in long COVID. People will often tell me, Dr. Malcolm, you know, this might sound strange, but is this something that you've heard before? And the answer is usually yes. Unfortunately, this virus has kind of done everything. Uh, POTS with the rapid heart rates, especially in the middle of the night. So these are his symptoms. And why that's important as a long COVID doctor is because I need to think about pathophysiology for each symptom. Hey, you've got fatigue. Okay, what can be the components of fatigue? Well, it could be mitochondrial damage. We know that the mitochondria make 90% of energy. We know from about four studies now in, in acute and long COVID that the mitochondria are damaged. And so that might be a component. Two, it could be microclotting. If you're not getting enough oxygen to organs, it's gonna make you feel fatigued. So each symptom is important to keep in your mind about what could be going on. So let's move on. So um, the unfortunate joke that, that long COVID patients often say is, I went to my primary care doctor, I went to my, you know, my NP, I went to a specialist and they said, hey, we did all your labs, good news, nothing's wrong with you. Um, and really that's just um, saying, we just don't have the tools right now to tell us what's going on. So he had a CT of his chest, it was unremarkable. His CTA, so looking at the blood flow of the arteries around his heart, the coronary arteries were normal. He had an echocardiogram twice, so ultrasound waves looking at the heart, that was unremarkable. It is important to look at in someone with, who had chest pain. Um, we do very rarely see um, heart damage that is available that you can see on an echocardiogram, so it is important to consider. Um, an EEG, which is electricity through the brain, looking kind of for like activity, was normal. Um, his MRI of his brain was normal, and his EMG, which is uh, electricity that goes down through his nerves, it's called an electromyograph, was unremarkable. So again, everything seemed to be pretty, pretty, pretty normal. So 
I'm going to go to a special history. And so what I mean by special history was, you know, three years ago when I was just seeing this, this was not on my radar. So for a guy like him, um, I'm indicating like what might get missed by like a general practitioner. So this history of hyperflexibility. So we make everyone do this thing called a Biden score and his Biden score was high. So for example, when he bends over, he can reach over his toes. And so uh, he sometimes will feel, and some of our patients notice this, that his head sometimes feels heavy. So that's important. Um, and why does that matter? Um, I'm going to direct everyone to this YouTube video. So this is Dr. Jennifer Curtin. She's one of the, the founders of Rhythm and an expert in MECFS. And she's talking with Gez Menninger, who is a long COVID um, uh, YouTuber, um, talking about how uh, long COVID and post-infectious syndromes can relate to structural issues. So here she's talking about cranial cervical instability. And you can see here on, on the side, this is my YouTube, um, which is just full of long COVID. And we, we've got, you know, Amy Proal, who talks a lot about viral persistence. And here's Gez talking about that as well. And we've got the microclots. There's a lot going on in long COVID. So um, for people who are looking, there are things. So let's move on. So I want to always know what people have tried. So he's tried acupuncture and kind of breathing in the Wim Hof method. So this is important. Why might acupuncture help? Well, uh, my brother's an acupuncturist. It helps to improve blood flow. So that might be important in a vascular inflammatory or microclotting issue. Uh, the breathing or the Wim Hof method, you are increasing oxygen. Maybe that is helping. Um, talking helped this guy. So it's a very interesting thing. And I always tell my patients, we want to know everything. We want to know everything about what is going on because it could be a clue. And talking might actually be stimulating the vagal nerve. And we know that the vagal nerve is actually damaged in long COVID. So it's just interesting that that might line up. He's tried cold water plunges and they've actually helped. And so there is some speak that I've seen in some articles and on Twitter about using cold water plunges actually to kind of get rid of the rid of toxins or spike protein in patients. And interestingly enough, it helped them. Allegra helped them. Um, Allegra is also called fexafenity and it's an antihistamine. Um, and so that might help with mast cell activation. Um, and then he tried some levothyroxine, which is a thyroid medicine. He had a very poor reaction to it. He tried phospholipids. So this is an interesting thing. He's saying this did help him. And um, this might be helping with, with tissue, uh, uh, helping tissues kind of repair themselves or it might help with endo endothelial damage. But really what I want to tell my patients is, I want to know everything. I added this last one in, which is paroxetine. So paroxetine is also called Paxil. It's used to treat anxiety and depression. Um, we all know that long COVID is not a psychologic disorder. That's just stupid. But I want to tell patients, you've been on a, a journey that is horrible. And of course, you might be depressed or anxious. This might be a tool for you to help you. It doesn't, in my opinion, help with the underlying thing that's going on, but I think it's perfectly fine to use these medicines and can be very helpful for people. So in a guy like this, he's coming to me and he's had several things that have helped him and it clues me into potentially things that are, that are going on. So again, MCAS or mast cell activation syndrome or MCA, mast cell activation, um, vagal nerve damage, endothelial damage. I want to jump to one of our next learning objectives, which is data organization. So this is kind of intentionally a little bit blurry. The way that we take patients' data at Rhythm is we have a whole data team that takes old lab, set, lab data from, you know, I have have patients who've seen hundreds of doctors, and we input it into our system and organize it such that when I see patients, it's presented to me in a way that I can quickly look at data and say, huh, this is what's abnormal with this young man. So it's a little blurry, but this is um, kind of the, the setting that shows uh, what's, what's, what's off about, about his labs. So let's go into a little bit more detail about his labs. So his white blood cells are low, just a little bit low, but are consistently at that level. His immunoglobulin G subclass one is low. And so that's from published data in long COVID that, that patients who had low IgG um, tended to get long COVID, and that might be because you weren't as good at fighting off infection. So I'm writing here, maybe this indicates a persistent virus or another virus or just a poor reaction to COVID. Um, 
is ECP or is eosinophil cationic protein is 16. This is not a lab that I really was all that familiar with before becoming a long COVID doc. Uh, this can indicate dysbiosis. So that's one thing that happens in long COVID is that the gut is damaged by COVID and we can run tests on people to see what the bacteria are doing there. This test can also indicate mast cell activation as well as allergies, um, as well as his immuno immunoglobulin E, um, which is an allergy related or mast cell activation one. So all of this together says, okay, is there mast cell activation or mast cell activation syndrome going on? Um, it's helpful. It tells me a little bit of something about a direction that I could go with him. His B6 was really high. And so I've seen this a lot of patients. So I want to really remark on this one because what happened to long COVID patients? Something bad, you know, something people got infection, they would go to their doctor or whoever and say, is there anything to do? And unfortunately, most people were met with, there's nothing to do, or I don't know. And so people went off into the forums um, and looked and vitamin B, B vitamins have helped a lot of my patients. But sometimes when B vitamin, uh, vitamin B6 is really low, it can cause neurotoxicity. But when it's really high, it can also do the same thing. So I told him to stop it. Um, so we started trialing medicine on him. So I tried singular on him. And so singular is also called botlicast. Montlacast has been a great drug for many of my patients. It doesn't work for everyone. And so I think I want to put a big star beside, you know, his, his medications. Long COVID, after doing this for three years now and dedicated for a year, we still don't know exactly what drug is going to work for some people. And so I will often have my patients, I tell, you, tell my patients, you got to hold my hand during this time because I'm going to be trialing things on you that... A patient who looked exactly like you improved upon this or your labs are indicating, but we still don't know. I will get to the fact that we are looking at data to, to tell us if things are helping people, to give us some clues. But Singular might bind spike protein and it ha certainly helps with mast cells and it did help this man. We tried something else called olipatidine. It's a nasal spray. It goes right up to the nose. It helps with mast cells as well. Um, and we're thinking it maybe helps with brain fog. So again, one of his big symptoms was brain fog. I've had it helpful in a handful of patients actually. Um, but we tried it on him and it didn't, didn't help. So let's keep moving on to his other things. So the other, other labs. So here's his platelets. So his platelets are, are clotting um, uh, 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 cells a little bit low. And so it's important for patients to understand why this might be. So I often will call this a consumptive process. So either platelets are not being made, so if the bone marrow is not working well enough, or if they're being destroyed. That can happen from an autoimmune issue. Again, this guy has history of hypothyroidism in the family. Um, or they're being destroyed in a microclot. Um, his bicarbonate is 33, which is mildly high. I want to take a quick second to talk about this. And I apologize that I'm talking so fast, but I tend to talk very fast because we got a lot of stuff to cover. But um, when you breathe in oxygen, you're exchanging carbon dioxide. And if you are having microclots to the lungs or some sort of vascular inflammation in the lungs, you are not getting rid of, of carbon dioxide as well. And what happens is, is that carbon dioxide then dissolves in the blood and makes it acidic. So the kidneys and the lungs work in tandem to handle that level of acidity in the body. And the kidneys will hold onto bicarb to fix this. The other reason why the bicarbonate might be high is because kidney damage does happen in long COVID. And that might be from damage directly from the virus or from microclotting or for some other reasons. But I just want to tell people the number of times that people have said, hey, my bicarb is like here. And back when I was doing this initially, I'm like, ah, it's just minorly, you know, up. This might be a clue about something. Now, this patient did have an elevated D-dimer. So that's high. Um, most long COVID patients don't have this. So the data is, is that around 20% of long COVID have an elevated D-dimer. A D-dimer is a marker for... Um, uh, <laughs> I just saw John Kay's reaction to this. Uh, there, he does have some. Uh, okay, anyway, his D dimer uh, was elevated. I got to tell you, most of my patients do not have an elevated D, D dimer. It's really less than 5% of my patients have an elevated D dimer. And so this is the process of long COVID is finding a marker that actually helps us. We then sent off a level of something called prothrombin fragment 1.2, and that was elevated. So I want to talk about this. Um, but this might be a marker for some sort of clotting that's going on. 
So we also did a special test. Um, I've had a lot of my patients do this. It's called the S1 uh, uh, immune subset assay. And it looks at a type of cell called a monocyte. So monocytes come in several different flavors, classical, non-classical, and intermediate. And when we looked at his, he had a positivity to his monocytes, meaning we think that they contain spike protein. We're not entirely sure, but at least it's stained for that. So that's a big positive, and that might indicate that he has persistent spike. So I wanted to jump to this paper right away. So this is from uh, Dr. Lobschner and Dr. Khan and Risa Pretorius and Del Kell and all these folks. Um, who have been looking at microclotting. And this came out two days ago. So really important, this is something obviously that's been going on in long COVID for a long time, but when data is published, it's really important. Right now, this is still a preprint, meaning they put it up, it's for all of us to look at, but what are they finding? Well, this is a tweet from Dr. Asad Khan last Wednesday, which was long COVID awareness day. And he's really showing that with microclotting therapy, so triple therapy, patients are get better, getting better. And look at this wide spread of symptoms, digestive problems, chest pain, depression, anxiety, sleep issues, muscle and joint pain, palpitation, palpitation shortness of breath, cognitive, cognitive dysfunction and fatigue. A lot of people got better. I always want to label, hey, there are a few people who didn't get better. And that's a mystery of long COVID is that long COVID is so many different things. But this is a really important study and very exciting. And so they show the microclotting assay, the fluorescent microscope that Rizzi Pretorius developed. And they can show in these three sets of patients that putting these patients on blood thinners improved their symptoms and these microclots went away. So very important data that came out two days ago. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what I think is going on. And so if you're my patient, you've seen this before, which is the endothelium, this big long tube. And oftentimes I'll use my hands or I'll use this water bottle or a cup that I'm drinking at, like some coffee out of, but this is the vasculature. And the inner lining of the vasculature is called the endothelium. And an endotheliitis is an inflama inflammation of, of that. And so we now know that the endothelium is like many tissues, it expresses ACE2. So there are more than 70 different types of tissue in the body. So lung tissue, testes, blood cells, uh, endothelium that express ACE2. And that means that the virus, SARS-CoV-2, can get in there. And so I wanted to, to make sure everyone was aware, this little kind of like turquoise green thing, that's spike protein. That's how I'm representing spike protein. So this is making spike protein. And it can be found in the blood of long COVID patients. So I'm inside the tube, I'm in here, and I can see spike protein floating around. So I know this. This is another article. This came out of Harvard University. They use an assay called the Samoa assay. And the Samoa assay was able to identify um, uh, uh, I've seen that uh, uh, Eddie has a quick question here, and I'll get to that, um, which is that there might be free-floating free spike in, in long COVID patients. So they were able to detect it in 60% of patients. It did kind of go up and down. Like you look at the time course and there was spike and then it went away and it came back. And that could be for many reasons. Maybe we're getting reinfected or maybe the virus is there and it's just creating spike protein kind of willy-nilly, but it was important to know because we know that there's spike there, okay? So there's one mechanism that I wanted to make sure. Um, for So uh, I, I will get to Eddie B's question um, to talk about endotheliitis. Um, but kind of moving forward, I wanted to talk about what then happens. So you get a, a, an attack of immune cells. So I'm, I'm calling a white blood cell this little circle here. So the white blood cell then goes up to the spike protein because that's a foreigner, I don't, I don't want you and it will gobble it up. And what it does is it presents it on its surface and it says, hey, I got something inside of me that the body needs to know about. And then that will tell a T cell that something's happening and we should may tell the B cell to make an antibody. But in this case, I'm going down this one theory. And this is a theory that I've used on a few patients. It doesn't work on everyone, um, but that this is a monocyte, a non-classical monocyte, it contains spike protein and it is releasing inflammatory molecules and results in an inflammation of the area around it. That's one theory. So let's get our, our antibody in. So that's what they're kind of shaped like. They're shaped like Y's. And um, these actually will attack spike protein because that's what, what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to bind up. 
So I wanted to mention this because there are several different mechanisms of what could be going on in terms of the endotheliitis. And so here we've got this inflammatory monocyte that's causing little damage to the inner lining of the vasculature. But it might not just be that monocyte. It might be free-floating spike that's just running into the endothelium causing damage. It might be immune complexes. So immune complexes are one an antigen, like a virus particle or whatever, binds with, with an antibody and it floats down through the blood and it gets stuck in the walls of the arteries. Or maybe it's an autoantibody and it's attacking the tissues or just causing general inflammation. But it's just important for my patients to understand that that process is going on. And I think that the endotheliitis is a big deal. So we've got this right here. We've got the endotheliitis. How do we test for that? So there's several different ways that we can think about endotheliitis. So this is Eddie B's question here. One of them is called the endopat test. So the endopat test is being used by a lot of the researchers in the recover trials. So recover trials, again, that's the $1.2 billion that the federal government is giving to long COVID researchers. I've had a handful of patients use the endopat test. The hard thing about the endopat test is that it's expensive and hard to come by. I've called many, many different clinics all around the country to try to find this. If anyone has found it, we are trying to put a database together of where this vocation is, but essentially it will detect endothelial damage. We can look at cytokine levels. We can uh, look at something called HSCRP, which is high sensitivity CRP, which as an internal medicine doc, I used to use in my patients who would have heart attacks to tell me, hey, is there inflammation going on in the coronary arteries? And then something called VEGF, uh, which might be high in certain patients telling me, huh, there's vascular inflammation going on. So I wanted to kind of, you know, say there are many markers of endothelial damage. And it's important. And why I harp on this is because of this patient, of this, of this article that came out of Canada in October 22, where they were able to say ANG1 and P-selectin are great markers for vascular inflammation. Okay, and this is what the group of patients look like. They look like long COVID patients. They had headaches and fevers and coughs and chest pain and diarrhea. And so it really ran the spectrum of long COVID patients, but they were able to diagnose long COVID using two vascular markers. And I'm noting from what Dr. Pretorius and Dr. Kell and Dr. Lobschner are saying is, I'm treating this with microclotting theory and even diarrhea and insomnia are going away. So is this an underlying fundamental cause of long COVID? So moving on, we have the endotheliitis and I think about what are other drugs that I can use for this? So there was a great nature paper that came out in around September of 2022 that talked about it. And I've used all of these medicines to help people. Statins have helped people. Metformin, there's a lot of talk on Twitter right now about using that as a drug. I'm not sure how effective it is, but I really want us to be able to mine our data to look to see. Um, Phenofibrate, I've, I've known a few docs that have used that and it's been helpful for, for, for a few patients. Um, vitamin C, lots of long COVID patients are on that. Um, Nexitol, uh, hard to get, but potentially a treatment. Fish oil, I've had a few patients come to me and say, Really, fish oil is the only thing that's helped me. Um, pycnogenol, this comes from the pine bark. Uh, it's a pine bark supplement. It's published in Nature. Um, and I've had a handful of patients say, this has really, really helped me. Um, Arterizol is another medicine. And I got to tell everyone, um, these aren't medicines that I, that I really had heard of. Uh, you know, half of them I hadn't heard of before becoming a long COVID doctor. And so it's just really important to, to remain open-minded, but also to listen and to look. And people will say, oh, have you heard about this drug? I will be the first person to say, no, I've never heard of that one. Let's give it a try. I will read more about it because these things are helping people. So there are lots of other ones. And the theory is that maybe it's helping the endothelium. And so one thing I wanted to bring up is if I'm having these nicks in the endothelium, are, is this a nidus for clotting to happen? Is that where the microclotting is happening? And we get these kind of piling on of little of platelets. So the little red circles here are platelets in this case. And so the other thing I wanted to bring up is we know from, from, from data that's published is that the platelets will bind spike. And these can result in these horrible microclots. 
shots. And so I stole this from one of uh, Reza Pretorius' papers, which is this, this insoluble kind of plaque plus clot that are in the blood of long COVID patients. And so there are several mechanisms of what, what might be going on to cause endothelial damage. Is it from spike? Is it from monocytes? Is it from antibody complex? Is it from inflammation? Is it from these complexes? And that's really what I wanted to underline to folks, to my patients, is that concept of, I do think that there is an endothelial microclotting damage going on. Do we know exactly where it's coming from? No. How can we approach this and how do we make sure that our patients understand what we can do? So with the microclotting, we can send microclotting tests. So at Rhythm, we've been sending a whole bunch of microclotting tests on people. And we actually now send it as the first set of lab tests on people. And we are trying to mine that data to tell us, is there something that we can easily test for? So for example, the Canadian study out of Ontario that showed ANG1 and P-selectin. I remember when that study came out and I got on the phone and I called Sigma Aldrich, which is the company that makes that. And I said, hey, you know, can I get this, this, this thing, this test for my patients? And they said, right now, this is only, you know, a scientific test. We can't use it in the lab. I am sure there are lots of people who are trying to fight and to find that test and make that test for people. But are there current tests that we can use to figure out what's going on here? Okay. And so we think we found a few of them, but we're not sure. And we're, we're continuing to look. So in line with that, we would start people on a variety of medications to eliminate the microclotting. So again, healing the endothelium, healing the microclotting. So what Rizu Pretorius and Doug Kell and all of them did is they use triple therapy, which is uh, aspirin and clopidogrel. Those are two antiplatelet medicines that affect the platelet in, a, uh, in two different ways, so kind of like a double whammy. Um, and then we can also use blood thinners. And so there are natural blood thinners. And so I saw a really great lecture with Dr. Uh, Lobschner where he says, you know, if you can't get on blood thinners, natokinase, lumbar kinase, serapeptidase, great options for patients. And again, I want to underline before I became a long COVID doctor, did I know what these were? No. And it is really from my patients that I've learned a lot of this and looking and reading and, and, and taking help from them. I put a little star beside the natokinase because I want to come back to that one. But a part of this is also Eloquis. And Eloquis is a blood thinner that I've used as a doctor um, for various uh, kind of issues, um, but is a part of this whole process. Okay, so the thing that I wanted to come back to is really this concept of the upstream process. Hey, we've got microclotting going on. We've got endothelial damage. And is the endothelial damage causing the microclotting? Is the microclotting this independent thing? But what's causing all of that in the first place? And so right here, I have the spike protein. Is that what's causing it? Doing a little big question mark here. Um, so that's a really important question. And so I wanted to dive into that a little bit. So this guy is actually a guy that actually improved on Maravarac. And so I put him on Maravarac. He felt like it helped him. And so Maravarac's an HIV drug I've used in a lot of patients. A lot of people um, in the forums will say, that doesn't work. A lot of people say, oh my gosh, that helped me a lot. It's all a part of long COVID. And we're going to get into why, what data we've mined ourselves to tell us what's, what's helping in people. But it helped him. And then we put him on a Torvastat, and that also helped him. And so this is a case series from a man named Bruce Patterson, who, who's kind of started the Maravarac uh, profile. I've used it in a lot of people. It helps around 25% of my patients, uh, maybe a little bit less, but it is something that uh, has helped people. So moving on, what would I do next in this guy's uh, case? So are there other spike binders or degraders out there? So... Um, are there antivirals? Does this guy actually have a persistent viral infection? So at Stanford right now, there is a uh, trial going on with 15 days of Paxlovid. And so I love my patients. So my patients, the one actually yesterday came to me and said, you know, I'm on the forums and someone is on the trial and they don't know if they're actually taking Paxlovid, but they're like, wow, you know, after a couple, uh, you know, 10 days of this, I am feeling different. This person doesn't know if they got Paxlova, but it's interesting that potentially this is helping people and that might indicate a persistent infection. Um, and then will we put him on further microclotting therapy? So this is a great uh, kind of uh, Twitter account by uh, someone named Long COVID PharmD. 
And so I wanted to underline this one because, oh, oh doo -doo -doo. did I drop or did I freeze? Oh, when did I freeze off? You dropped like my veg. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure where I dropped off here, but uh, uh, maybe, uh, haha, all good. There. Okay, I'm just going to continue that. Okay. Um, so I like this Twitter account. So this is a, uh, a pharmacist who's been mining data for, for long COVID folks. And she's actually got, um, uh, <laughs> she's got, uh, she's, she's trying, she's asking people questions and I encourage people go fill out her surveys. Like this is all about helping you and finding this, but this is uh, looking at fatigue improvement and look, Nata kinase. Uh, NK is one of the, uh, in combination with lumbar kinase and, and or seropeptidase has really helped people. And that might be important for several reasons. So I wanted to jump to natokinase. What is it doing? It could be bind, it could be binding spike protein. So I gave this young man Maraviroc, it helped him. Is it because I'm getting rid of a monocyte or is it because I'm binding spike protein? I don't know yet. I'm gonna talk about a little bit about that, but maybe natokinase could help him. Curcertin helps with mast cell activation syndrome and mast cell activation, but there is some data that it in, uh, that it might be binding spike protein as well. <laughs> There's some commentary that I'm enjoying right now. Um, NAC uh, and acetylcysteine, which is something that we're recommending all our long COVID patients use. Actually, um, there's some in silico, meaning computer modeling, that it's binding spike protein. It also supports the mitochondria. And in the study that came out of Yale University using guanfacine, which is a medicine that I use a lot of, um, they kind of use it in combination. And so I like telling people, hey, I was using natokinase because I thought that was a blood thinner. Maybe it's binding spike protein. Hey, I was using Curcertin because this person seemed like a mast cell patient. Well, is it actually binding spike? I was using NAC because I thought it helped the mitochondria. Well, it actually did it do something else. So I want people to know that we got to keep looking and we got to keep um, finding this data out. Curcumin, lots of patients are on that in silico data that's helping bind spike protein as well as inflammation. Rutin uh, in silico. It's a part of something called Vedicinols 9, which is a medication lots of my patients are using. And actually in that survey that I put up from Long COVID Farm D is helping some folks. Um, and there are dozens of medicines. There are so many medicines out there that could potentially do it, but it's about trying medicine to see if we can help. The antivirals for persistent COVID, so Tolovid is an, uh, a herbal supplement that we wanna talk about as well as Paxlovid I mentioned. And so I wanna talk about the rhythm data that we're having. So I've mentioned this to a few of my patients, but something that I wanna make sure um, is you know, that we are mining data. We are taking your data. We have some really smart folks on our team, a few mathematicians and artificial intelligence folks. And this is the point is, can we offer you information that as we collect data, to tell us if something's working. So for example, we looked at Tolovid. So Tolovid is a something from a Chinese medicine herb called the Gromwell root. They basically did a large screen of hundreds of molecules and found that this was the most potent one against COVID. Um, data from that company saying, hey, we're earning like maybe 50% of people better. Uh, in our own data, eight out of 24 have improved on this. But unfortunately, when we stop it, it kind of went away. So is that telling us, hey, this is important for people who might have persistent virus. And so this is where we're going to continue to look at this to see if it's helping. Um, the S1 non-classical monocyte. So we have mined this data in our patients. And what we are finding at Rhythm is that if you do test positive for spike protein in your monocytes, it tends to improve symptoms. And I have tried Maraviroc on lots of folk, lots of folks. And it really actually was one of the first medicines that, that drove me to going into long COVID. But really the fact that it didn't, didn't work on everyone was really the most important thing. And it's about finding out when, when would this might work. And so I wanna tell our patients, we've mined the data and it looks like this is what it is telling us that it's important to get that test because it can tell us to use Maraviroc. The correct, Maraviroc doesn't come without um, side effects. It can cause liver toxicity extremely rarely, but also it can be expensive. So I just wanted to make sure people were aware of that. So I wanted to go to back to our case. So in our case, this gentleman had an elevated prothrombin 1.2 level. Now, as a, an internist, I never used this level ever before. 
Um, but this is a great article that was talking about using prothrombin fragment 1.2 in patients with acute COVID. And I'm boxing this off right here. What they're saying is prothrombin 1 fragment 1.2 had a superior specificity and conferred a higher positive likelihood ratio on identifying patients with, with thrombosis, which is blood clotting. And then going here, so prothrombin fragment 1.2 may be a useful assay and may and potentially may be more discriminant than D-dimer in identifying thrombotic manifestations in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So I wanted to go back to our patient. So what I did with him is I had his prothrombin level, and then I gave him a Rabirac, and then I gave him statin, and his prothrombin level decreased and his symptoms improved. So the level went down like that. We don't know yet if this is a good marker. There's lots of potential markers out, out there. But as a rhythm patient, we're taking your data, we're applying things, and we're finding out what is a good marker on how this might improve you. So we make you all send a lot of surveys. So I apologize for that. But why are these surveys important? Because they are, it is data, it, it, it is uh, surveys on how scientists and doctors communicate. Hey, I publish an article and I say, you know, uh, the 30-year-old man, he improved. Okay, what does improved mean? Using an actual scoring system can be helpful. And this is one of the ones that we use. And his score went up indicating that he's having improvement in the symptoms. And he says it to me himself. Hey, I improved. So that is my presentation for now. I really wanted to underline um, this is a tough illness. The hard part about it is that people are putting their hands up and they're saying, we don't know what's going on. We know a lot of what's going on. We do. And we're searching. We're searching for labs that exist. But also at Rhythm, we have a lab. We have many talented people in our lab. And they are trying to invent new tests. And we will be giving these, our, these tests to our patients when they're available. Um, don't give up. This is, I think, one of the most important things in the history of, of the world right now. And I can't imagine what it's like to be a long COVID patient, but um, I've immensely enjoyed being a long COVID doctor. And um, as hard as it's been for me to try to find things to help people, I think about my patients and feeling um, uh, alone. And I always just wanna say that you're not alone and that we're gonna keep looking. We're going to keep looking until we, to, until we figure this out. So thank you, everyone who came to this, this um, talk. I hope you learned something you might not have. I talk a lot in my patient appointments. Um, so I'm going to really open it up for um, any questions or any commentary or anything that anyone wants to talk about, because I know that this might be a, um, a great time to talk. So I'm going to read some of the commentary. OK, we've got some good things here. Um, mostly it's just uh, that I froze. <laughs> Um, to do to do uh, spike protein. Never mind. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. So yeah, I'll I'll kind of leave it open for a few moments if anyone has any questions. But um, good job, very informative. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we have a great question from Elise. So this is the trillion dollar question, Elise, which it's so our question is, I might may have missed it, but how do you test to see if you have the virus uh, present in your, your system? This is really a trillion dollar question. Okay, so Walt's test, the Samoa assay, I have heard that it might uh, be available in a few months for, for commercial use. Okay, so Again, it's not going to be positive in all long COVID patients, but hey, you've got spike floating in you. That probably indicates that there is an underlying infection. Number two, I think the monocyte subset test is a great test. Number three, the microclotting test might be a good like proxy. But in terms of finding that test saying, hey, I swabbed my nose, you have PCR, it doesn't exist. There might be something looking at tissue, like in the gut, that might be something that we would want to do. And there is a test that looks at T cell function. So a T cell, again, is something comes up to an antigen 
and says, hey, there's something there, we can look at the function of a T cell to see if it is being stimulated by a specific COVID protein. So it might indicate that you have ongoing antigen there. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have ongoing viral persistence, but at least I've, I've tried to do, uh, this is really the, 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 really the most important question. We don't have it yet, but what I would tell you is people are looking, there maybe are proxies, and I would really kind of just counsel my patients on, hey, can we use this test as a potential clue that that was, is what's going on? What I really do want to also say to people is, you know, what's a test? A test is something that I use as a tool to give me information. Sometimes it's really just what patients are saying. So I, I, I think I don't want to, you know, make it sound silly, but if someone says, hey, I unfortunately got acute COVID during this time, and I took Paxlovid, or I took Tolovid, and oh my gosh, I got better, or I got monoclonal antibodies, or I'm looking at Twitter and a whole bunch of people are getting better. That is really enough for me to say that there's persistent virus going on. Uh, John's got a question. What is the longest interval after acute infection that new symptoms can still emerge? I don't know that question. What I what that answer? Normally what I see is it's between immediate and three months thereafter. But in terms of like, hey, is there something latent going on and we're not sure? I don't know. Like all of a sudden, like a year later, I don't think that's what's happening, John, but I think it's uh, within within that time frame. Uh, Ryan's asking, did your patients have to remain on meds for an extended time frame or were they able to cease medications? So this is a really hard question. So uh, again, what Elise asked, which is, do you have a test that tells me if uh, I have got persistent COVID? No, we don't. But what we're mining at Rhythm right now is saying, hey, maybe the microclotting tests are coming down or the spike protein test. I do like the monocyte spike protein test as I use it and then I follow up on it. And if it's gone away, I can remove certain therapy. We do it slow and we see if people have uh, like an adverse reaction or if they have a flare that tells me, hey, we need to be a little bit slower and to reconsider it. It's hard because that test is expensive, but that is an option. Um, what I would say is the timeline of meds, I wanna talk about microclotting. So, the initial paper that came out of South Africa was Rizzi Pretoria is doing this on 24 patients, 24 long COVID patients. And she found that all 24 of them improved and she only did it for a month. So I want to tell people long COVID has existed for at least three years. And so if you're a patient that has had it for a long time, what the data is showing is it's tougher to treat. But I don't want my patients going into this saying, okay, I'm going to commit to triple therapy and say, okay, I'm going to give it a month. No. What I want to do with my patients is I want to get that microclotting test. And again, one thing we are working with an outside clinic that do does have Rhesia pretorius's test, um, the microclotting assay to say, huh, okay, we've got it. Let's do a month and then repeat that test. And do you still have lots of microclots or is your prothrombin still high or whatever? and use that as a proxy because you might be a person that, hey, you've done you know triple therapy for a month and that's what the South Africans said to do, but actually you need a couple months or you need a year on this. It's important to hear that because everyone's different and that is being reflected in the um, forums. Some people will say, hey, you know, my, my clinician told me, you gotta be on Maravarac and a statin or you gotta be on microclotting therapy for a month. I did it, it didn't work, but I actually ignored their recommendation and I stuck on it for six months and whoa, that was the thing. Or I was on natokinase and I really just kept at it, I kept at it, I kept at it, and then there was a, a, a switch that flipped. We still don't know because so much of this is being done just like in clinics, we're not getting data shared. So that's again, what we're trying to do. Um, but what I would tell people is we don't know the timeframes yet. I would say, Every time you talk to your clinician, make sure you're aware of that. Hey, how are we making this decision? Are we making it based on my symptoms? Are we making it based on a lab? Okay, uh, has there been any progress in, in convincing insurance to cover some of the more specialized COVID labs? What would it take to convince them? Yes, so this is from JC. There is not a lot of help on this. So 
Uh, I got to be honest with you. When we, when I send labs or when I send things up, I've kind of learned don't use long COVID for particular things. And it's not like I'm doing something illegal here. It's more, I'm just saying, hey, this person's got long COVID, which universally people just kind of get scared of. I say, hey, actually, this person has an abnormal coagulation profile. And all of a sudden, potentially medicines are covered under that. And I'm not lying because I've got tests to prove it. So, JC, there's not a lot of um, not a lot of progress on that. That's what we're trying to do. If I can design and if rhythm, what I mean is uh, uh, if rhythm can design a system that we're, we're producing data in real time and we're, we're getting to that point and we can start turning this out and say, hey, this is long COVID. This is how we've defined you. And we're doing testing now. Um, and this is showing outcomes. Can we use that as convincing data? We're not quite there yet, but that's the dream. So really your answer, not a lot of progress. Um, what is a good threshold for knowing you're ready to level up on your, your exertion? Uh, what, what is a good threshold for, oh, okay. Like, I guess, John, do you mean like, uh, for example, I've managed to go from PEM almost every, uh, almost after everything to be able to do PEM after a bar. Sorry, let me restart. For example, I've managed to go from PEM after everything to being able to do a bar class with no PEM for three weeks and counting, thanks to rhythm. Okay, but how sh long should I stay at that level before shifting up to the next year of exertion? Super hard question, John. And um, there, you know, David uh, Petrino, um, him, uh, he's at Mount Sinai. He is a physical therapist. They're really kind of trying to look at this. There are a lot of really smart physical therapists out there. But what I tell people is you've got to you, you, you really have to be your own advocate in this and start monitoring this. So our EMR currently, you can look at like, uh, um, you know, your eye watch, you can look at like heart rate stuff, start looking at your heart rate and start jotting it down like in an Excel file, or if you have a monitor, what's my heart rate during at this thing and do exercise, get your heart rate a little bit up, see how you do. And then the week later, bump it up by 10, you know, do a little bit more exercise. So your heart rate's a little bit low, see it go very slow and see how we react. So John, not a great answer, but really it's about being slow, self monitoring saying, Hey, I tried this. I went up this much and this is how I'm, and, and I'm not having any issues. That's all we really got right now. And that a lot of uh, kind of the protocols in MBCFS, like the CHOP protocol, we really go really, really slow, but kind of like a, a poor man's way to do this would just be, self-monitoring, looking at heart rates and seeing how you're doing. Uh, Richard is saying, how does your approach differ from MECFS patients? I've never had COVID and have been ill for 20 years. I don't think I have spike protein. Yeah, exactly. So this was a conversation really on post-vaccine and long COVID. So for, for you, Richard, the question is, is well, what is MECFS? So MECFS is a condition that's defined by certain symptoms. And we, um, and about 80% of the time is from a post-infection, but 20% of the time, it could be like an autoimmune condition. It could be a, a rare mitochondrial dysfunction. We got to really kind of bootstrap this and send off a whole bunch of different labs. So a lot of our labs are geared towards more long COVID, but some of them are, are a lot of MECFS. So MECFS, hey, are we looking at your enterovirus? Are we looking at um, HHV6, CMV? Are we looking at potential tick-borne infection? Have we looked at a really extensive amount of autoimmunity? We are developing the cell trend assay at Rhythm. So that's looking at autoantibodies directed at certain receptors. So that's one thing. Taking a good look at your mitochondria, um, genetic testing, there are a lot. So I just kind of want to say, you know, a lot of what we did at Rhythm was starting at long COVID. And long COVID, I really want to think about a virus or a post-vaccine injury that has spike protein and focusing on that. But really what we've done is apply MECFS to long COVID. And all of the principles that we've used in long COVID, so mast cell activation, MECF, uh, sorry, mast cell activation or mast cell activation syndrome, we'll want to take a look at that. Um, just you, Richard, I'm actually going to be seeing you. I've actually found some positive tests on you. So I want you to be reassured that I actually, a part of our approach, like we, we found a few things. So uh, thank you for the question, but that's kind of in short. Mary, uh, Mary, great question, John. Okay, great. Apple Watch is super handy. Great. Uh, can you connect a wearable device to healthy as well so the data goes into your chart? Thank you, Ryan, current CEO of our company. Yes, you can. <laughs> you can connect uh, a wearable device uh, to healthy. So currently, I think we have the iWatch. Um, I don't think the Oura Ring does it, Fitbit does it. 
Um, so if you have any questions about that, please make sure you're reaching out to us if you have any concerns. Healthy does have this. Um, but you know, any EMR that we're gonna be using is gonna be able to do this. John K, just did, did that test like last week. Hopefully it will prove useful to rhythm. Awesome. Okay, SJ is typing something. I think we're running out of time. Maybe SJ, I'll answer your question. Um, uh, so do some IVIGs affect MCATs differently than others? I was told by an infusion nurse that all, but one, uh, let me read that again. Do some intravenous immunoglobulins affect MCATs differently than others. Was told by an infusion nurse that that all, but one may uh, one make it worse. SJ, do you want to rewrite that that question for me? I'm going to take a little bit of time on this. So, intravenous immunoglobulins. You take the blood of thousands of individuals, and you filter it. Uh, you really put it all together, and you get IV intravenous immunoglobulins. And these immunoglobulins we can use for two reasons. One is to bind up bad autoantibodies. So if if long COVID or ME-CFS is an autoantibody disease, can we give it to bind these up? Or can we give it for immunodeficiency? And that's one reason we use IVIG. There was a paper out of, I think, Connecticut that has used IVIG in long COVID patients. It's really tough. And I've had this conversation with a lot of my patients um, about trying to get IVIG covered. It's very difficult. It's about finding really that autoantibody that might prove to your insurance company that's something we should try. So back to SJ's question, was told that people with MCAS should be on Privagen per her other patient's doc, and that proved to help reduce the effects of MCAS. So uh, Privagen, I just wanted to make sure that we're bringing that, this up, is just a type of um, IVIG. I want to go back to this question. So MCAS is mast cell activation syndrome and has certain diagnostic criteria. And one of the things I like telling people is MCAS or mast cell activation happens for a reason, either from an antigen, from a virus, from an allergen, from an autoantibody. So in some people, if this is your autoantibody, uh, is if autoantibodies are causing MCAS, then yes, you could con conceivably use IVIG. I don't... Uh, um, I, I don't have, you know, most MCAS patients are not on IVIG. Um, so uh, I don't have a great answer for you, but that it is a part of it, but it's hard to get covered to treat. And that MCAS can be caused by many, many different things, one of which is spike protein or persistent COVID. Yes, yeah, so uh, HS, so uh, I'm, Mary, I'm going to put this up. So um, there's so many viruses out there. So H -A -H -H V 6 is human herpes virus 6. HSV 1 and 2 are human herpes virus, like the oral and genital uh, herpes. So I've seen, you know, talk about both of them. So Akiko Iwasaki's paper, so she's a really great immunologist at Yale University, and she's doing a lot of the immunology research. She found in her studies that EBV is first and foremost the one that's being reactivated. Then, then um, varicella zoster, so shingles, and then rubella, and then kind of everything else was non-significant. But I have heard a lot of patients, uh, sorry, a lot of other long COVID clinicians say, ooh, I'm seeing reactivation of HHV6. I've seen it in very few patients, not a lot, but it, but it is um, something that might potentially be activated and we would like to really find that out. Um, and uh, yeah, so it would be the concept of it, one of those viruses being reactivated from COVID or from spike protein. Great. Okay. I think we're at time. I think Mary's just sending a quick message, but we'll, we'll kind of uh, do it. Thanks, Mary. I love you. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, thank you for bearing with us. We're still a startup company. We All we do all day long is talk about long COVID. And, um, um, you know, I just wanted to reflect and say, um, I've tried my best. I, uh, I, I, I really immensely appreciate all my patients and we're not going to give up. And I think the system we're designing at Rhythm, really looking, uh, using uh, an artificial intelligence approach, being able to mine our data, creating a, a lab 
really is going to be the thing that does it. And so thank you all. Continue to to teach me about long COVID and, and good luck. And uh, we will all see you soon. Okay. Take care. Have a good day.